All right, it is 501 and I'd like to call this meeting of the Lansing City Council's Committee of the Whole to order and ask that our clerk please call the roll. Council Member Hussein? Here. Council Member Wood? Here. Council Member Spitzley? She's Council here. Member Dunbar? Yeah. Council Member Jackson? Council Member Bett? Here. Council Member Spadafore? Present. Quorum is present. Um, moving on to our minutes. Uh, just real quick, also council members, we are still um, using the um, the raise hand, even though it looks a little different today. Uh, we're using the webinar feature. Uh, it's, it's better for larger crowds. Um, so we're gonna keep doing that um, until we change course. So uh, the first item of business is the approval of the minutes from June 22nd, 2020. And I will ask for a motion from Vice President Hussein. Sure, President Spadafore, I'd move the June 22nd, 2020 minutes as presented. Thank you. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, uh, will the clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Hussein? Yes. Councilmember Spitzley? Yes. Councilmember Wood? Yes. Councilmember Betts? Yes. Councilmember Dunbar? Yes. Councilmember Spadafore? Yes. Um, and now that I am actually on the video, um, I don't see Councilmember Jackson here. Is that correct? Let me just do a quick double check on the. Nope. Not yet. Well, hold on just a second. Um, hello, phone number ending in 2610, just confirming you're not Councilmember Jackson. Hello. Yes, hi. Nope, I don't think that's Councilmember Jackson. <laughs> Okay, motion for the minutes carries seven zero. Thank you. Uh, first thing first, we've got with us our, um, I think she's still our city treasurer for another little bit at any rate. Um, we'll be presenting on the Downtown Lansing Inc. assessment that we, um, we discussed at length a couple weeks ago. Um, Ms. Kaler, I think it's your last official duty as the treasurer, if you wouldn't mind uh, giving us that presentation. You have been elevated to a, pres a panelist so you can share your screen and um, uh, your, your video and audio if you wish. Okay. Not, okay. Let's see. Host disabled participant screen saving. Uh, try again. Sorry. Okay. And I don't, I don't really have a presentation because I sent the memo to you. I really just planned on coming here and talking to you regarding if that's all right with everyone. Works for me. And everyone's nodding their heads too, so. Okay, great, good. So I, you know, just to reiterate what the memo stated. Um, so the reason why the lag in the invoicing for the DLI was due to a couple things. One, we had um, a new treasurer, we had a new executive director of DLI, and then we also had a new finance director. And typically what would happen in the past is Angie would trigger that and we would know that boom, we're supposed to, to invoice out the DLI. So we were all new, no one knew the timing of this. So once we did discover that, we sent the invoices out on October 19th, which with, with the due date of November 19th. Yeah, I'm sorry, November 19th was the due date. So typically when the DLI assessments haven't been paid. Uh, Madam Treasurer, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, this is my fault. I skipped right over public comment and I should not have done that. So my apologies, we'll come right back to you, um, but we do have two hands raised for public comment. No one, ever, no one ever say I'm against transparency. I just overlooked that one real quick. So um, the first hand to go up was Loretta Stanaway. Loretta, you are now free to talk and I'm gonna try and, you're unmuted, you have three minutes. Okay, um, there are several things that I wanted to touch on the Committee on Equity, Diversity and Inclusion. Um, I don't really know exactly what you have in mind with that. And I hope that whatever is done with appointing people to that, that there is an even handedness to that. And it's not a stacked committee that is overbearingly aimed at one particular 
group or class or race of people, I think that you have to be very careful with that, that you are balanced. Um, I don't know what you're thinking about in terms of council meeting locations. If you're thinking of a place where you could meet where people could come in public again, I would be all for that. Um, social districts, I have no clue what that relates to and there was nothing in any information packet that I could access that told me what it was. Um, so I would just add that uh, I'm not sure if this is the time to talk about uh, the issues to do with Black Lives Matter or, or not. Um, if it is, I'll proceed. Okay, I'm not hearing a no. So I just hope that the council is very aware that the group who has been the loud, loudest is very far from being the largest group of citizens. And we could never agree to divert taxpayer dollars to a specific race. We have never done that. We never should do that. I doubt that it's legal, it would be discriminatory. Uh, we have specified classes of people in the past, but never a race of people. And I don't think that would be a wise choice to, to pursue. Uh, that's all I have for right now. Thank you, Loretta. Next up for public comment is Doris Witherspoon. Doris, uh, you have three minutes. As soon as I get my timer reset, and you are unmuted. Go for it. Go for it. No, I I don't have any comments. I just I I can't. I'm trying to uh, work with this computer and and uh, figure out stuff. And so I just noticed that my hand was raised, so I did lower. I don't have any comments. Okay. Well, welcome to the meeting. And okay, well, welcome to the meeting. And thank you. And yeah. welcome to the club and on the computer thing. <laughs> Um, Ms. Kaler, we are now back to you. Apologize for the, uh, the dramatic shift in direction, but needed to get that taken care of. Thank you very much. So just picking up, so we um, had new employees and we realized that the invoices were being mailed out late or later than previously mailed out. So the assessments that were unpaid were not able to be rolled over to the winter tax roll, which was December 1st. So we are now, we sent out um, the assessments on the tax roll. So that's July 1st. So that's what caused the, the cash lag or cash flow lag for DLI. Okay. So to, to, I'm sorry. No, sorry. There was a pause there. I thought you were finished. Please continue. So to, make sure that that never happens again we have we're writing procedures and also putting the the timeline as to when those things should happen because when i first came into office there weren't things that were documented so it's kind of like a learn on the fly and i don't advocate for that to to continue so we have a schedule of when certain bills and payments and things should go out okay we have, are, are you all set, Ms. Keeler? I'm sorry. I am, yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Wood has her hand up. Council Member Wood. Thank you, President Spadafore. Um, I, you sort of answered my question that I had, which was um, how are we going to make sure that this doesn't happen again? You said you were putting some procedures in place. Are those procedures um, going to be handled both by um, Downtown Inc? Um, as well as the finance um, director and treasurer, or how how are those procedures um, going to be dealt with in the future? That's a good question. Thank you. So we're developing document, and it will be distributed to the DLI executive, so that if there's another executive director, then that person will also have that knowledge, and then also it will be shared with finance, so that we're all on the same page and all in alignment with the timeline. Thank you, that answers my question. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Keeler. Um, we'll, we'll revisit uh, you in just a few minutes on a different subject, but I think we're all set unless there's other questions from the council. All right, thank you, moving on. The first item before us is a resolution that deals with several reappointments, um, two to the, I'm sorry, one to the police, Board of Commission, 
The Board of Police Commission, rather, Clyde Carnegie representing the fourth ward with a term expiring June 30th. Uh, Georgina Nelson on the Board of Fire Commissioners for the fourth ward with a term to expire 6-30-2024. Rodney Singleton is an at-large board at large member of the Board of Fire Commissioners with a term uh, 6 30 2024. Mr. Larry Leatherwood for an at large member, Lansing Entertainment and Public Facilities Authority, term expiring on 6 30 2023. And Melissa C. Jeffries at large on the Board of Review with a term to expire 6 30 2023. Um, these five appointments are reappointments, rather, um, and we will take them as one motion unless Council sees otherwise. So we'll need a motion to get the resolution for us. President Spada, before I would move the resolution. Well, thank you. The motion is before us. Is there any discussion on this uh, item? Uh, please raise your hand. Uh, Council Member Wood. Um, thank you. I just want to verify with the administration that even though these are um, reappointments, that um, all of these have been vetted to make sure that they are still in compliance with the charter requirements. Uh, Ms. Harkins. Yes. I think I heard a yes. Yes. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Spitzley. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, and, and I think this is more of a comment for going forward. You know, as we are moving forward, and one of the things that um, we were doing in our ad hoc committee on diversity. Um, was looking at the different appointments and making sure that, you know, they are representative of our community, um, whether it's, um, you know, disabilities or, or racial or gender. Um, and I think that that's something that we really need to look at. I'm sure the mayor's office is, but um, I think that that is something that we really need to start looking at a little closer and um, you know the at large for the at large ones you know how it's representative of our community thank you thank you very much councilmember spitzley seeing no other hands i will ask the clerk to please call the roll councilmember spitzley yes yeah. <laughs> councilmember wood yes councilmember betts yes councilmember dunbar Yes. Council Member Spadafore? Yes. Council Member Hussein? Yes. Resolution on reappointments carries 7 0. Hey, Sherry, I'm here tonight, by the way. Oh. Who did I miss? Council Member Garza. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Some strange guy from the second ward. I don't know who he is. Well, <laughs> she counted you as a yes without your input, so we got to go back and check all our votes. <laughs> <laughs> I can see you. I apologize. I prepped my list ahead of time. <laughs> All right. Uh, Council Member Garza, with your permission, we will move on. Very good. <laughs> Next item is a resolution introducing and setting the public hearing for an ordinance to modify members of the Employees Retirement System Board of Trustee. I'm sorry, Council Member um, Hussein. Sure. Uh, just very quickly, um, I don't. I thought maybe you'd have somebody uh, here to speak. Oh no, I'll have you do really the. Quick. I'll have you do the motion. I can explain it. Perfect. Okay, I would move the resolution. Thank you very much. So um, the resolution before us is setting a public hearing to amend the um, Employee Retirement System Board of Trustees membership composition. Currently, there is a requirement that we have a citizen on the board, but it is a citizen of the state of Michigan. So this would add to the board a citizen of the city of Lansing. Our current citizen representative is a longtime serving member, uh, Scott Dedick, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and rather than pull him off to appoint a city resident, we've thought to expand the board, the mayor's proposing rather to expand the board and um, add a citizen of the city of Lansing. Um, these change, Jim, correct me if I'm wrong, I, I could be wrong here, is sitting in a ordinance review committee in the ERS board, which has not met because it was referred just before the, the new year. And then, um, as you all are aware, um, things got a little weird uh, So, to, to, as an understatement. So they have not yet met to review them, but the, um, the ordinance does require public hearing to get it moving. So um, I'm, a, I'm the city council's representative on that board. I will reach out to folks um, before we 
meet again and see if we can if we can shake that loose and get the input of the of the um, ERS board before we move forward as a body. But having the public hearing should not, in my opinion, my personal opinion, um, be delayed uh, for that. We can delay action on the amendment, but not. Uh, I would suggest having the public hearing if we could. So that's that. I see Councilmember Woods' hand is up. Uh, thank you, President Spadafore. Um, I, I won't oppose um, setting the public hearing, but I will oppose any action until there is a recommendation from the ERS board. We have on any of the issues dealing with the retirement boards, both the ERS and police and fire have asked the board's input before we have voted on any resolution now or any ordinance changes. That does not mean that we have to accept their recommendation, um, but we have asked for that recommendation. So um, the fact that you're gonna be taking this back to the board and getting those um, comments. Um, my other comment would be, you know, I, I realize that moving this forward, I am extremely disappointed that we are not seeing the entire ERS revised res, uh, ordinance. This ordinance has been out there for revision for the last six, almost seven years. Um, number of times that I sat on that board as well as um, other members of, of council that, that um, the um, revised ERS resolution has been uh, looked at. Police and Fire has um, their uh, ordinance was changed. Um, we have managed to move that forward and, and get that. Um, but I would hope that one of the things that's done as soon as possible, since it's my understanding, you're in the final phases of, the, of uh, moving that ordinance forward, that it be done sooner than later. Um, okay, that seems to be the only question I've got. Um, so without any further ado, let's move forward with the resolution setting the public hearing. Um, and just as a, let me just make sure I've got the date correct. Uh, the public hearing- July 27th, 7 p.m. July 27th, 2013, or 2020. Wow, okay. 7 p.m. Uh, online. Okay, would the clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Garza. Yes. Councilmember Spitzley. Yes. Councilmember Hussein. Yes. Councilmember Betts. Yes. Councilmember Dunbar. Yes. Councilmember Spadafore. Yes. Councilmember Wood. Yes. Motion carries seven zero to set the public hearing for July twenty seventh for the introduction of the ordinance to modify members of the Employees Retirement System Board of Trustees. Thank you. Next item is a council rule change to rule 16, the Committee on Equity, Diversity and Inclusion. As you all remember during our resolution, which passed create, uh, affirming uh, the county's declaration that racism is a public health crisis, um, we created- um, Excuse me, Council President Spadafore, I believe you skipped one. See oh yeah. The this, yeah, the yeah, amendment, the, the, which I believe you have quite a few members um, from the I staff see that, online. Yeah. Thank you. Um, if, if city staff would raise their hand, I see Don Kalhanik, I'm gonna allow you to speak and not that I'm allowing you to speak. That's just the technical term Zoom says. Uh, Barb Kimmel, there we go. You uh, should have Doris Witherspoon is actually with that department also. She was on a few minutes ago. Got it, yep, uh, let me find. Kim Coleman. Kim Coleman has also got her hand up. All right, so I've got Don Kalhanik, um, Barbara, Krista, Kimber, Kim Coleman, and Doris Witherspoon, all a part of, allowed to speak now. Um, if you're on your phone, it starts six to unmute you. Otherwise, just push the microphone button on your, uh, on your device. The first thing, the thing we do to have before us, though, is a substantial amendment to the CDBG CV ESG CV. So I'm um, sure we'll get an explanation about what all of that stands for in just a minute. But as you'll recall, um, a couple weeks ago, we passed a, a minor amendment to the process for input on substantial amendments to the CDBG plan. 
Uh, this is now the actual amendment to the plan. It also brings in $1.2 million in CARES Act money through CDBG and 608,000 money in ESG funds, which Emergency Services Grant, I think is the acronym that we're looking at there. Um, but I will turn it over to the department to present um, in more detail what it is we're looking at here um, as a city council. So uh, Don Kalhanek, I'm gonna turn it over to you and then you can you can tell me who should be speaking first, but I know you, the memo came from, oh, Doris, actually, I'm sorry, I'm gonna turn over to Doris. Doris, this memo came from you. Actually, uh, can you hear me, uh, Mr. President? Yes, I can, Don. Okay, I think I'll just kick off here okay. and, and start. Um, so you're right, we are here to discuss the substantial amendment uh, to the action plan for the purposes of C the CDBG as well as ESG COVID money. I'm sorry, let me just do a quick introduction. I know you just went through everybody, um, but not I suppose not everybody knows who they all are. I'm Don Klahanek, the development manager within EDP and joining me is Barb Kimmel. She is the community development coordinator in EDP and Doris Witherspoon is the senior, senior planner within EDP. Uh, and you've heard from all of us in the past. We also have uh, today with us Kim Coleman, who's the director of HRCS. And Kim is with us uh, specifically if any questions come up regarding uh, the ESG, uh, anything in particular, Kim and her team. And there may be another member of her team somewhere out there. I believe Katrina might, might have been joining us as well. I don't know if she made it on or not. Uh, so, okay. So, uh, we, we have before you the resolution to approve the substantial amendment to the action plan. It's required by HUD, uh, yet another step in their lengthy process, but one of the very last ones in their lengthy process as we move forward to being able to expend these special COVID funds. As you'll recall from past meetings, uh, these are funds that were appropriated as part of the CARES Act. Uh, we did, unfortunately, have to wait many months for guidance from HUD on the process we needed to follow, but we've gotten it, and here we are today. With regard to the CDBG funds, um, HUD has allocated the city um, $1,203,250 um, to spend uh, to address the it, and it has to, in some fashion, address the COVID crisis that we have in front of us. Um, the uh, department determined the prior, prioritization and allocation of, of the CDBG C, CB funds by discussing community needs with HRCS, the continuum of care, LEAP, uh, and uh, the Ingham County Health Department. Um, we, we, uh, you know, the need is huge. Uh, we all, it's almost fathomless. Uh, we, we, um, we're, we're facing the, you know, the largest economic crisis, certainly of our times. And they've given us 1.2 million. So we're not going to be able to address every single thing that everybody would like. We've narrowed it down to three individual activities. First, um, <clears throat> We intend to use, um, uh, uh, let me get the exact number, $660,000 uh, to fund grants for businesses. Uh, we intend to go through LEAP to do that. As you know, LEAP has administered other programs like this in the past. Um, This will, this is intended to uh, provide funds for uh, small businesses that employ low and moderate income residents that are a vital part of our economy. Um, they uh, demonstrated a need for working capital to retain jobs and cover costs to stay afloat. LEAP will uh, grant CDBG CV funds to businesses as working capital for the purpose of retaining jobs. Um, they will also uh, provide technical assistance to um, small businesses um, who uh, may need that kind of help. Um, in addition to that, uh, there will be, I apologize, I have to look at the number every time, $110,000. Uh, allocated to Michigan Woman Forward, which is the former Entrepreneur Institute. Now, 
Michigan Women Forward, their focus is on microenterprise. Microenterprise is a business that employs fewer than five people. So these are the very, very small businesses. Uh, but their activity will be very similar to what um, LEAP is doing. It's just a different focus, a, a, a different kind of business. They'll also be doing uh, some grants as well as EA to help microenterprises navigate this, this problem. They'll provide counseling and microloans to establish or expand microenterprises located in Lansing to provide home health care, delivery services, cleaning, and other services required to support the home health quarantine. And then lastly, um, about 200, and I apologize, I didn't think to add these numbers up, but just shy of, just shy of $300,000 will be allocated to uh, Capital Area Housing Partnership for um, homelessness prevention. CHP um, is going to uh, use these funds to prevent homelessness for residents whose income is between 51 and 81 percent of area median income and that could include payment of housing expenses such as mortgage payments rent and utility for up to three months on behalf of those households um, and um, i do want to say that some of the documents we gave you that address capital area housing partnership state that there will be up to $26,200 in administrative funds allocated in, in order to administer the grant. And they say that, that those funds will be provided to HRCS. That's a typographical error. It should not say that. Those administrative funds obviously always go to the entity that's administering the program. And so that should have said um, the $26,200 would be provided to Capital Area Housing Partnership, not HRCS. So that's the CDBG CV funds. There's also ESG CV funds. And um, ESG, uh, ten, uh, they, those funds are used in certain specified categories that are required by the ESG program. So they're, they're going to invest uh, just over $100,000 in street outreach to encampments to provide PPE, COVID screenings and referral to COVID health related services such as testing, isolation and contagion centers. About 417,000 will be for emergency sh shelter expenses to include decongregating shelters to create social distancing and enhance safety and moving um, high risk, people who are at high risk for COVID-19 to non-congregate settings such as hotels. Uh, $26,000 for homeless prevention will also come out of H, uh, um, the, excuse me, out of these ESG funds. Uh, and there's uh, a small amount there for administration as well. Um, so that's the, that's the overview. I'm sure you might have some questions. And as we go through them, we'll, uh, Barb and Doris and I will try to address the CDBG questions you might have and hopefully Kim and her team is there to try to address in any more detail the ESG questions you might have. Thank you very much, Don. <clears throat> um, first up, we have Council Member Spitzley with a question. Patricia. Thank you, Mr. President. So um, on the, on the, the grants, um, on the dollars that are allocated to entities like LEAP, um, is there, once those dollars are allocated, there's no more um, council oversight um, on, as to how those grants are administered or the application um, or any type of overview, um, the, the dollars are just administered to LEAP and they, and they, they um, put forth the criteria and figure out who's eligible? Well, um, this is in essence like any appropriation the city, the city handles, which the, the short answer to that is yes. This is the opportunity for council to ask these questions. And, um, and after which you'll be asked to vote on them. In terms of the particulars of the program, that's something that um, will be dictated by a contract we will enter into with LEAP that will determine um, those, those kinds of details. 
If I may, Mr. President, I yeah, mean, when we were um, went through the program for like the facade grants, I know that council was somewhat, you know, involved in the process and the criteria. Um, is there a timeline on this um, as to why um, that, you know, we just we're just going to appropriate the money to leap and then leave them to um, figure out who who are the recipients? Um, that's the first question. The second question is, um, will there be some sort of reporting back, review back to council or to the administration on, you know, who who the dollars were given to, what was the purpose of the dollar, what what was the purpose of, um, you know, what were those dollars used for? So I'm not sure if that question was addressed to me or not, but in terms of the reporting back, um, they'll definitely leap, leap and as well as the other two agencies will definitely have to um, do a final report and close out the grant at the end. And we will have all that information and can certainly provide it to council. But there's no, there's no requirement. Though, right? Oh, it'll be required in the contract we entered in. No, we, it, we it, enter into the mess. That's, let me put it this way. That's think of that more as a HUD requirement. Okay. I, I mean, this is what this is what we do. This, um, you know, all of our partners have to report back to us at least annually, if not more frequently. We monitor them actively. We we um, you can ask them. They're they're uh, well looked at how they handle funds. Yeah, I, I know. I was just I didn't know if there was there was going to be a report back to council. So thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Spitzley. Councilmember Wood. Thank you, President Spadafore. Um, I guess part of my concern is um, in seeing some of these um, funds that will be used to help businesses. Um, are, and, you know, I don't think Don can answer the question at this point, but um, is some of the criteria, similar to what Councilmember Spisley was saying, is some of the criteria are going to be determining whether they've received a other grant money, whether um, the PPP program or whether they receive um, dollars um, from the Michigan development. I mean, there's there's been a number of pots of dollars out there. And I, I would think that one of the things that we should be um, cognizant of is that there are businesses that haven't received anything versus the fact that there are some businesses that have re received two and three different types of grant um, opportunities. And so I would hope that there would be something written in that type of criteria that again, the first ones that it would be um, going to are ones that haven't received some of these other grant processes. Uh, uh, or Mr. Uh, comes in, I think uh, Deputy Mayor Harkins can speak to this point. I can. Thank you, Councilmember Wood. That's an excellent point. I've been on two of the review committees for the uh, LEAP loans that have been given out so far, and that is a criteria that we have written into those contracts and that we'll continue to focus on in the future. It's something that it's a really great point. We're very sensitive about not only for the pots of money like MEDC and things like that, but also for if they've gotten other assistance from the city. So if, for example, they've gotten money from HRCS or other of our programs, we're trying to make sure that we're not giving the same businesses this money over and over again. So that's a great point. And so we're going to all the contracts. The, the other oh, thing that I would uh, I'm want sorry, if I, can, if I can just jump ahead. in and add to uh, uh, what Samantha just said, that's also a HUD requirement. And so okay. we're, we're very cognizant of that particular issue and, uh, and, and uh, we'll definitely address it with, with our partners. I, again, I think some of the things that have been raised by um, council members, whether we're talking facade grants or whether we're talking uh, these types of, of dollars is the equity among the four wards and making sure um, that there is um, businesses throughout the four wards that are having an opportunity to apply for these grants and being awarded and that it not be clustered um, in one particular ward. Thank you, Council Member Wood. Are you all set? Yep, thank you. 
All right, um, Council Member Hussein, um, unless Council Member Wood addressed your issue, you are next. Oh, no, I'll, I'll, I'll speak a little bit more at length with regards to that, President Spadafor. Um, you know, we had a, obviously an MEDC process um, and, and program, and through that program, we had about 22 grants uh, that were distributed to businesses uh, in the city of Lansing. We also had two uh, different rounds that were part of the LEDC process. Um, and through that, I believe we had another 46 uh, grants that were distributed to businesses. Those grants ranged anywhere from $5,000 to $10,000. And so, so for some of these businesses, uh, particularly some of these micro enterprises, um, that money really was the difference between them staying open and not staying open. Unfortunately, through those three uh, rounds, only three of the 68 grants went to businesses in Southwest Lansing. If you look at um, the MEDC process, 70% of those grants went to the historic core that are supported by associations such as the Rio Town uh, Commercial Association, the Old Town Commercial Association, and Downtown Lansing, Inc. Uh, what I struggle with um, when we talk about equitable distribution, um, you're, you're getting some feedback, uh, President Spadafore. I don't know who that is. Um, but in any event, what I struggle with is that we, you know, we went through every single grant. Uh, we went through the, the applications that made it through the tax check. Uh, and there were. There were a number of businesses that could have received that money in South Lansing, but it was um, – quoted to me that those grants were quote unquote middle of the road. When I, when I drilled down on that a little bit, it was explained to me that the grants just weren't written maybe um, as soundly as some of the other grants that had been submitted. Um, and I, you know, and I've challenged the folks that I talked to um, to consider the lack of support that some businesses, when we talk about marginalized communities, when we talk about economically disadvantaged communities, they do not have the same infrastructure in place. Number one, to hear about these grants, to have the you know, adequate amount of time to actually submit these grants, and then also to have individuals that, are, as an example, are professional grant writers to serve as guides on the side. So I've challenged um, our administration, I've challenged LEAP officials um, that through this next round that they consider all of those things and they make sure that some of our disadvantaged parts of town, and it's not just Southwest Lansing, obviously as ward representative, I'm gonna to speak to Southwest Lansing, but that they ensure that some of that money is deployed to those corridors and districts. Uh, because if you look you know, across the city of Lansing, we do have areas that disproportionately um, have disreputable predatory businesses descend on those corridors and districts. And when we, and, when we and, and, and maybe it's an unintended consequence in terms of the rubric and things of that nature, but when we don't make sure that resources are equitably distributed, we actually are um, part of the problem. And so I, I want to uh, make sure that the administration is hearing us loud and clear, um, as well as LEAP, that uh, we, we have to find a better process to ensure that these dollars are equitably, I would have taken equally, uh, but equitably distributed across the city of Lansing. Thank you. Thank you, um, Councilmember uh, Hussein. Sorry, I'm admitting Councilmember Jackson here to the meeting. He was having some tech difficulties. Um, okay, uh, follow up that uh, Councilmember Hussein's remarks will be Councilmember Spitzley, Councilmember Betts, and then I would like to add some comments if I may. Councilmember Spitzley. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, you know, I, I can't speak as eloquently as Councilmember Hussein, but I think it's important that, you know, in light of everything that's happened and in light of you know, some of the administration's comments about um, making sure that we don't forget, you know, our undeserved community, un unrepresented communities and, you know, minority businesses and, and, um, and making sure that we have representation. I, I am hoping that, and that's part of my concern is just making sure that we are reviewing these um, grant applications through those lenses. It's not enough to just put in criteria that say you're going to consider those um, those businesses, those businesses that are unrepresented and those businesses that are in um, challenged areas. You, you have to provide them with the tools to, as Councilmember Hussein, to write the to write the grants. They don't have those tools, and so they don't write the grants as well, and so they're automatically um, disadvantaged from before they even submit a grant because they don't have the tools to write the grants. And so we have to do better um, in um, opportunities and providing assistance to those businesses that don't have grant writers on staff and then making sure that um, women owned businesses, minority owned businesses, um, businesses in, in um, the lower, um, you know, in some of the uh, distressed neighborhoods are, are also getting assistance to write the grants so that they can compete um, 
um, adequately and fairly um, in the grant process. Thank you. Thank you. Um, got a few more hands now. Council Member Betts. Thank you, President Spadafore. One thing that I noticed uh, from the last round of LEAP grants is there are a number of uh, developers and or management companies plus uh, la landlords generally that received grants and they ended up kicking out some of their business owners who were particularly in, in my ward who were members of the constituent uh, organization that got the money. So I, I just want to make sure that if we are giving landlords money, if we are giving business landlords money, that they actually give those things back to their subsequent businesses, their, their tenants. Because I think that it's ridiculous that we'd give money to a group of people who are extracting rent and they're not going to give anything in return to the so that's something that I think LEAP should look at and the city should be very aware of. Thank you, um, Council Member Betts. I do want to also, um, I'm not, not to discredit anything anyone is saying, I did. I was able to find also our City of Lansing CDBG eligible areas. Um, there is a map online that shows where those CDBG areas are and these business grants would only be available for um, the um, in the CDBG areas, but uh, just as a more for the point of clarification, I'm not, not discrediting or d discounting anything that anyone said, just as a point of reference, if you read the document a little bit closer, there is that requirement in there as well. But I'll move on uh, to Council Member Wood, Council Member Dunbar, and then I would, I'll, I'll interject. Uh, thank you, President Spadafore. My question to Don uh, is, what is the timeline with this? Um, have um, the monies been received? Um, uh, when, if not, when are they expected? And how long will they have to apply um, for the grants? Hi there. Good morning. Um, that was a little bit of feedback. Uh, the money will be received after council votes tonight, we will uh, be able to um, submit the final documents that we need to submit to HUD. And um, they've actually been uh, pretty expeditious. I would expect uh, within a few weeks that money will be received, which is quite a bit quicker than um, historically HUD has, HUD has responded. Um, I'm sorry, the rest of your question is how, how soon will it be spent? Is that the rest of your question? The, the, the timeline for people to apply for the grants, you know, oftentimes we hear about these things, we put them out um, for our constituents and we find that the turnaround time is, you know, very uh, short turnaround time and people haven't had the opportunity again to apply that might because of the turnaround time. So. Um, is any of that part of the consideration that's going on? Yeah, I, uh, what I'd like to do is if uh, President Spadafore will unmute Barb Kimmel from my staff, I think she yep. can get into perhaps some of that detail a little bit better than I'm going to be able to. Ms. Kimmel, you are, you are um, all clear to speak. Thanks, I appreciate it and, and good evening everybody. So I just want to be clear that these are CDBG funds. They're very different from the funding that LEAP has been um, putting out. Um, this is called a grant program, but it really is going to be a 0% interest loan program that will be forgiven after a year when the business meets its, its funding goals. So we will be tracking that information. The maximum loan amount is $50,000. The minimum loan amount will be $1,000. The program has to complete by September of 2022. Um, part, of, part of LEAP's job will be to submit a work plan and that work plan will include a plan, a marketing plan to show us how they will affirmatively market the program to businesses that meet national objectives and also um, reach businesses that are identified as businesses of preference, women-owned businesses, minority-owned businesses, those types of businesses. Um, these funds can be used for businesses that are located in the CBG eligible areas or for businesses whose 
service area is located in the CDBG eligible areas. Um, so there's two ways that they can, they can actively use this money. There's not going to be a grant application for these funds. There's actually going to be a loan application for the funds. The loan application will be underwritten with criteria that we're spelling out, but we want to make sure that we reach businesses who, for whatever reason, were unable to access earlier funding, and there will be no duplication of funding. So this, this program will be aimed at businesses who maybe couldn't get earlier funding because they didn't meet um, the, the underwriting requirements of the SBA or um, some other loan program. So um, we are really going to work hard to make sure that we seek out the underserved um, and um, put, put this money out there to help those businesses provide services to this, the low and moderate income CDBG eligible areas. Okay, that answers my question. Thank you. Council Member Dunbar. Thank you. That actually answers most of my question. I my the one thing left that I would have is um, if you are if you are you actively seeking out the businesses or would you be waiting for them to come to you after having been notified that this is available and is any of the money like I noticed that there's technical assistance to support businesses in establishing an emergency plan, but is there technical assistance to even help them with the application for the loan? Is that available? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. We're going to be um, helping them. And as far as the marketing plan um, regarding outreach to the businesses, this is something that um, LEAP is going to have to provide to us um, and we're going to have to approve. And they're receiving quite a bit of administrative funding for this. Um, it wouldn't be beyond the realm of my expectation that they actually um, hire someone to design this program to specifically meet the, or to specifically reach out to the um, businesses that we want to um, engage with this program. Oh. Thank you. Uh, council member down there, thumbs up if you're all set. Thank you. Uh, council member Spitzley rounding out the, the, the roster here. Sorry. Um, I, the fact that it's a loan program kind of makes me even more nervous. And, and I, I, was, I was pleased to hear some of the safeguards that you're going to put in place to to attract minority businesses and and women-owned businesses but we see across the country though that those businesses are also um, having trouble getting approved for loans and so it's it's i think it's great that we're targeting those businesses but again you know if we're not providing them with the tools and that they can actually get the loans that they're applying for we're, we're once again just kind of spinning around in place. And so um, I'm glad, as, as Councilmember Dunbar um, asked, I'm glad that there are technical assistance to write the loans. But, you know, how are we making sure that those businesses are as competitive as possible to the banks or, or to LEAP or to wherever they need to get this loan and to make sure that they qualify? Yep. I hear exactly what you're saying, and one of the parts of this plan is to provide um, some assistance, some actual technical assistance to these businesses um, so that they have um, access to what they need in order to succeed. Um, the underwriting requirements for this loan will um, be such that uh, businesses that we target will be able to access these funds. It's a 0% interest deferred loan. There are no payments required by the business on this loan. Ever or until, I'm sorry. After one year, it's going to be uh, removed. It'll be discharged. Oh, okay. Excellent. Uh, Council Member Dunbar. Yeah, I was just going to follow up on that because what I 
finding with a lot of businesses that have applied to the CPP is that um, they're not, they, they got through the process to apply, but the details of what's necessary for them to get the forgiveness is, is difficult. So I just wanted to make sure whatever technical assistance is available to them at the beginning would be available to them throughout the process and in whatever uh, is needed to be filed for the forgiveness. I'm going to say yes. And I'm also going to say that if a business's plan has to change during the year um, of the coronavirus um, for various reasons, then we're going to allow them to modify their plan um, so that, um, you know, so that we can make sure that we're assisting them in the best way that we can. This is something that we're going to make sure that LEAP monitors. So if they come to us and they say, hey, I need this, I need this money in order to pay the wages of my people, um, and then we get, um, uh, then they find out that they need to install a uh, new, um, air handling system so that they have uh, uh, positive air pressure inside the building um, in order to not just to, to not contribute to the spread of coronavirus and they want to use some of those loan funds for that. Let's just say we would allow that. They would just need to modify their plan. Thank you. Funds to be Thank you. useful. Thank you very much. I think that uh, answers my members' question. And I was my question was going to be um, can you put in the resolution a requirement that an, a certain percent of loans or grants. When I was going to ask the question, go to minority owned businesses. But it appears that that's the intent behind some of the federal requirements anyway. So it may be superfluous in the resolution. So thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I. I don't remember if we have a motion before us, but I don't think we do. So I'll recognize Vice President Hussein for the motion. Sure, I would move the uh, resolution for the substantial amendment to the fiscal year 2019 annual action plan uh, so that we can receive federal care dollars. Thank you, the motion has been moved uh, properly before us. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, um, would the clerk please call the roll? And uh, before you do that, Sherry, city staff, thank you for your time. I'm gonna take you guys off the, the talking option. Oh. Uh, President Spanifor, real quick. Oh, yes. Uh, just a question. Uh, after you vote now, will anybody be needed uh, for the council meeting to follow? Does anybody feel that uh, I think the supporting documents are adequate um, and we'll have the, the administration online. So I think that all of you may enjoy what is left of this beautiful Michigan evening. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Madam, uh, Mrs. Mrs. Boak, would you please call the roll? Councilmember Dunbar. Yes. Councilmember Betts? Yes. Councilmember Hussein? Yes. Councilmember Spitzley? Yes. Councilmember Jackson? Yes. Councilmember Wood? Yes. Councilmember Garza? Yes. Councilmember Spadafore? Yes. Motion carries 8 0 for the resolution on the substantial amendment to the CDBG and ESG uh, CV funds. Thank you, uh, Sherry. Um, so folks, now we are to uh, council rule change for rule 16, establishing the Committee on Equity, Diversity and Inclusion. This is introduction. Um, many of you know that a council rule can't change until this, the meeting after the meeting it was discussed. So I'm hoping that we can move this forward Monday tonight rather so that on the 27th, it's officially official. Um, but we will begin the work of that committee before, um, before it's technically real because Jim will probably be a little upset with me, but I, I view that the resolution that established the committee started the rule change process and formalizing it. And he's going to laugh at me, which he's doing right now and all that jazz. But um, just to let you all do know, I do know the rules and I'm just trying to bend them just a teeny bit to get us moving. So um, in there is a charge of the committee on um, equity, diversity, inclusion. It's found on page 32 of your committee, the whole packet. This is a combination of a little bit of the feedback I heard from folks, uh, as well as keeping the charge general enough that um, it wasn't, you know, you will do this on Tuesdays kind of thing, but rather a general charge aimed at 
relevant policies to improve the health of black and brown communities, support local, state, and federal initiatives that advance social justice and racial equity, um, assess current and proposed laws and policies, as well as their implementation to promote health for black and brown residents of the city of Lansing, to assess internal policies and procedures to ensure racial equity is a core element in all organizational practices and the requirement to report back to council committee of the whole, not less than quarterly. Further, I added um, the committee will develop budget recommendations and priorities and submit them to the city for city council for consideration as part of the annual budgeting process to ensure city resources are expended toward public services that achieve the goals and charge of this committee. Um, you know, this is a permanent committee, so I wanted to make sure it was it had a, a long a long term goal. And obviously, if these words are not adequate or um, inclusive of, of everyone's wishes, we can amend them now and on the floor um, uh, later this evening. So I will turn it over to um, actually I will ask for a motion uh, from Council Vice President Hussein to get it in front of us and then I will go to questions. Um, Mr. Vice President. Sure, I would uh, move the resolution pertaining to the council rule change. Uh, this would be an amendment to rule 16 by inserting the committee on equity, diversity and inclusion and establish its charge. Uh, again, tonight, what we would do as part of council um, is receive it and review it. And then we would take a look, I believe on July 27th for passage. So with that being said, I'd move the resolution. Thank you. And we just want to clarify, we did make sure that this did not eliminate the other committees by accident, which the first draft did. So this one does add a new committee, not eliminate all the other committees, although many of you might have liked that. It would have lessened our workload a little bit. But uh, Council Member Betts, you're up. I haven't written up an amendment or anything, but just a suggestion. I Maybe we can work this in. Um, I, I want to make sure that it's included that we look at laws for their equity as well, because we as, as a council body look at ordinances and policies. And I think we'd be remiss to not speak to the racially inequitable policies that exist in the city of Lansing, the ordinances themselves that might be racially inequitable. And I think that that's something that we all agree that we need to be looking at. So I don't know if we should write in some additional language. I don't know how everybody thinks about or what everybody thinks about that. I'd, I'd be interested in feedback. Council Member Betts, I don't see a problem with what you've proposed. Um, I would suggest that um, if we get out of here uh, before six, maybe spend a few minutes and take a look at the, the language of the resolution and draft something for the floor. Um, there is, it does speak to laws, current and proposed laws. So if there's a, a tweak that needs to be made there, I'm sure that that's quite acceptable. Okay, I, I mean, if that was the intent, then that's fine. Yep, okay, Great. very good. Council Member Jackson. Yes, thank you. Kind of on that same um, path, just looking at the language in the first paragraph, I was just wondering, should we change the word racial equality to racial equity? Just since that's kind of been a big topic and there is a little difference and it would touch council person bets, I don't know, statement. Yep, that, and that language was pulled straight from the resolution on um, the racism as a public health crisis. So I will accept that as a well, I, I didn't make the motion. So um, council member Hussein, are you good with a friendly amendment there to change that to equity? Certainly. Okay. Um, council member Jackson, are you all set? Thank you. Uh, council member Garza. Thank you, council president. I just, uh, just maybe a suggestion. I'm looking here and it says the committee of equity, diversity, inclusion will establish relevant policies that improve health in the black and brown communities. What about changing that to uh, the color, communities of color? So it's, it's not just a black and brown, you know, other people might not, you know, think they're included in that. Yep, uh, that's possible too. Um, we had this a little bit, uh, you were there, I, I know, but we had a little bit of discussion just for those paying attention at home about whether the um, the ordinance, or I'm sorry, the resolution spoke to um, black black and brown or other communities of color and whatever the will of the council is on this one. Um, it sounds like you're making a motion to um, improve the health in black, brown and other communities of color. Can, can we do black, brown, indigenous and other communities of color just to fit with the, uh, the language of the day? Yes. Let me get a making notes on my copy here. That would be BIPOC. Yeah. Black brown indigenous and other communities of color 
So I'm going to ask Sherry, are you taking notes on this for laser fish? I am. Very good. So everywhere where we mentioned black and brown communities, please do, please insert black comma brown comma indigenous comma and other communities of color. Um, I will fight you about the Oxford comma and it's going to be in this resolution. So hearing no objection to that, um, I will move. Uh, Council, I see Councilmember Jackson, but I wanna make sure Councilmember Garza, you're all set. Thumbs up if you're good. Very good. Um, Council Member Jackson. So not to, I really want to stay away from a debate on, you know, what is and what isn't, but isn't, you know, black and then brown kind of like every other it person is. of color? I mean, there's, there's shades of brown, but you know, it's all good. I know we're trying to be inclusive, but I just feel like that really encompasses everything when you say black and brown. I know the language of the day currently is BIPOC, which is Black, Indigenous, and People of Color. Um, so if the council wants to do B BIPOC, we can do that. Or if we want to keep the, the brown, um, I would like to be as inclusive as possible. So um, you, you all let me know the will of the council. And that's what Sherry will put in laser fish. Miss, okay, well, let's, we'll, we'll do BIPOC then, um, Sherry. Uh, we can we can confab after this, but it will be B I P O C Black Indigenous and People of Black Indigenous People of Color, and make sure there's an Oxford comma in there. Okay, Councilmember Jackson, are you all set? Thank you, sir. Okay, we have an amended resolution before us. Um, seeing no further discussion on the issue, um, I would ask that our clerk please call the roll. Um, and again, this will come up tonight on Council. And if there are further changes we need before then, please make sure you. Um, get them out and we can discuss them at council on the floor. This, well, we don't really have a floor anymore because we're virtual, but we'll discuss them at council. Uh, Mr. Smirka, you got your hand up. Please go ahead and um, address the council. Yes, uh, when we get to council, you know, looking at the rule for amendment. I'm sorry, I can't yeah, hear you. Yeah, Jim, I'm having a hard time hearing you, sir. Um, somebody should make a motion at council then that motion can't be acted upon until the next meeting. Okay, so we make a motion on the on the rules at the next at the meeting tonight and yes. then we act on it on on next the twenty seventh. Yes. Thank you for that, sir. Did you hear me okay? Um you're having a little bit of cutout. Maybe on council you might want to use your phone to call in and use your video to see us, but we'll we'll figure that out later. Thank you. Okay. Um Seeing no further discussion, would Sherry, would you please call the roll? Councilmember Hussein. Yes. Councilmember Wood. Yes. Councilmember Spitzley. Yes. Councilmember Jackson. Yes. Councilmember Garza. Yes. Councilmember Betts. Yes. Councilmember Dunbar. Yes. Councilmember Spadafore. Yes. Motion carries eight zero. Thank you very much. Uh, the next item on our agenda is a resolution um, two, 2019, uh, amending resolution 2019-309 for the 2020 council meeting locations. Um, as many of you are aware, uh, we have been uh, meeting virtually um, and the potential that if we do go back in person, although it sounds like we might not be doing that until after Labor Day, um, is that uh, we need a, a secondary location in case the um, social distancing requirements need to be fulfilled. So um, the uh, resolution before you would uh, designate the alternative city council chambers as the South Washington office complex drill room at 2500 South Washington Square. And the resolution would allow us to meet in council chambers, the alternative council chambers or via Zoom. Um, and the reason we have to designate council chambers, just in case anyone's interested in that, is technically the mayor controls all city real estate that is not council chambers. So we had to designate this as an alternate council chamber so that city council rules apply during city council meetings, i.e. crowd control and, you know, just general me getting to tell you all what to do type things. So um, I have a vested interest in this, uh, this resolution myself, but it does... Um, lay out the rest of the meetings for the year that they may be um, at the um, 
alternate council chambers, uh, city chambers, as usual on the 10th floor or uh, via Zoom. So uh, Mr. Vice President, if I could take a motion to approve, then we'll open up for discussion. So moved. Resolution before us uh, designating alternative council chambers and authorization to continue meeting via Zoom is before us. I have two hands up so far, Council Member Spitzley, then Dunbar. Thank you, Mr. President. So I just have a general question. Are we really, are you saying that there's a good chance that we, we may not be meeting in, per, in person until September? Is that the-, the Right now the executive order for that carries us through um, the 31st of July. Um, but um, in consultation with the health department, indoor meetings are still capped at 10. And right now there are 16 city employees and city council members on this call. So we are over capacity, even with the people that sit at the dais. So um, it is impractical to hold a city council meeting indoors at this point in time. Um, and almost impossible to hold one outdoors. <laughs> so um, not impossible, but nearly. So uh, yes, as long as the law allows it, we will continue to meet virtually um, to encourage public participation and our safety. Council Member Dunbar. Thank you. I, um, I, I'm fine meeting by Zoom or in person over at um, the SWAC, but I, I would like to know if there's been any discussion about continuing the Zoom process with a deck, like putting up a, a Zoom deck so that we can have participation from the public um, who can't get to meetings or who it's not safe for them to be in meetings because we've really, we've opened up a door here that I don't wanna close on public participation via video or phone call because we've had a far more robust conversation um, with a lot more people who haven't participated before. And I'd really like to see that continue. Yes, um, so the, the conversation is, um, is happening and I have um, been talking with the city attorney's office and city TV about ways to encourage um, or to allow for that to happen. The logistics are, if we do it in chambers, it's easier because everything's right there. Um, figuring out how to run a Zoom meeting and an in-person meeting are presenting a few challenges, particularly for me, the person who will be chairing said meetings. Um, so we're, we're trying to figure it out. It's, it's not a no, it's just a, while we don't have to answer it definitively yet, we're working on trying to find the best answer for it and, and the technology to make it real. Because um, I'm, I'm certainly been one who's been supportive of the virtual presence, um, even if it is just for public participation in our meetings, um, that that would be something I'd be very open to. It's just a matter of making it happen. And I don't think, um, at least the preliminary information I've seen from the city attorney's office, as long as we maintain that visual component or that, um, that the, the, the two-way component, and it, for the public, it should be okay, but that's, they haven't yet signed off on a, on a plan yet because we don't have one. So um, let me just give me a little bit more time. It sounds like that um, folks not wearing masks are gonna give me a little bit more time regardless. So we'll, we'll have some time to kind of figure that out. And hopefully by September, um, we'll have a plan that, that, that addresses your concern, uh, Council Member Dunbar. And if we don't, there'll be a good reason for it. Council Member Betts, oh, are you all set? So um, if, if the clerk could please call the roll on um, amending resolution 2019-309. Council member Hussein? Yes. yes. Council member Wood? Yes. Council member Spitzley? I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. yes. Council, Council member Dunbar? Yes. Council member Jackson? Yes. Council member Betts? Yes. Council member Garza? Yes. Council member Spadafore? Yes. Motion carries 8-0 to amend the resolution 2019-309 for the 2020 council meeting locations, 8-0. Yes. So the next item is for discussion only um, because I, we wanted to get it started. Um, a couple weeks ago, Governor Whitmer signed into law a pair of bills that deal with uh, to-go cocktails and social districts. Now, there's a lot going on in this world, um, but this one is something that I think will help businesses across the city. We've been approached by DLI and a few business owners to uh, take a look at creating social districts and social zones in the city. A social district is an area in which one can, a governing body can establish social zones um, where uh, retailers, uh, particularly uh, licensed retailers through the Michigan Liquor Control Commission that are um, dine-in 
so restaurants and bars, not, not liquor stores. Um, you can create a social district, and in those districts, um, patrons may purchase drinks to be consumed outside of the establishment but within the zone. Um, it's an effort to try and allow them to set up more distance um, and increase capacity. But we've had some conversations preliminarily with folks. Uh, one zone that is going to be looked at is that I'm proposing to look at would be um, behind um, uh, Grand Traverse Pie, Envy, Kelly's, um, that, that area there, that alley, um, which is not a fire lane. Um, and then how, allowing uh, DLI and others to um, um, kind of turn that into a social district there. And then um, along the river um, near um, P squared, the Lansing Center, I'm sorry, it's not P squared, um, MP Social, the Lansing Center. Um, and then um, there's one more licensee there and I can't think of it. Off the, oh, the city market facility, the old city market facility. Um, and then another another district that I've uh, been approached about has been the um, uh, the space over behind the avenue and the uh, the green door uh, as a third potential district. And then others have mentioned going into Rio Town and Old Town, and then any other place that we can think of. So I'm starting this conversation today, letting folks know that I don't have every nook and cranny of the city memorized as to where a good spot might be for one of these social districts, and encouraging you all to reach out to your um, your networks and help us find um, places that would um, that would make sense. I have on the line um, Kathleen Edgerly from Downtown Lansing Inc. and Scott Ellis from the Michigan Licensed Beverage Association, who also owns Michigan Distillery over on Chiawassee, um, to answer more specific questions. What we would have to do is we would approve a resolution creating these social districts and social zones, which would then be submitted to the Michigan Liquor Control Commission for approval or denial. Um, and I might be getting the process a little wrong here, but Lisa Hagen's on the line as well. Um, but if there are questions, um, let me, I'll let you have those time to talk about those. But first, let me open it up to um, Kathleen or Scott, if you'd like to add anything that I've missed or misstated. Um, you are a panelist and free to unmute yourselves and present. So Kathleen, looks like you're ready to say something. Thanks, Peter. And Scott, please, of course, feel free to jump in. Thank you, everybody, for your time. And thank you, Peter, for introducing this discussion. We have had a number of our downtown business owners, as well as those just outside of the PSD, approach us about this concept. They've seen it work in other communities around Florida and Toronto. Um, and really just having the conversation and discussion with you about what your initial thoughts are, feelings as we continue to look at social districts and how we can be creative in supporting these businesses as they have a very long road to recovery ahead of them and designating these specific zones as areas where um, folks could go ahead and visit a number of establishments. It is not meant to be anything uh, causing raucous problems or anything of that nature, but you could go from business to business, for instance, somebody likes something at Envy, somebody else likes something else at Edmonds, um, and going between the two as well. So Scott, if you want to jump in with more of the specifics, that would sure. be great. Sure, I'll just give a quick background. I, if I, am I echoing? No, you're good. Okay, I am on my end. Um, so we, obviously this was to help get us recovered, all the bars and restaurants recover and get us back on our feet. And these have been done in Ohio, Austin, several places. Um, and they encourage people to come downtown, hit location to location, and be able to experience a cocktail in a place or a drink, move on to the next one. Mm -hmm. Then the establishments can also maybe provide some entertainment and split the costs that'll be outside. And it'll be out maybe in an area in that, within that zone. We have spent two years with working on this with the governor's office and liquor control. Um, and so we think we have the process down pretty good, but as you know, the city start applying and there'll be questions that are coming up. Uh, Petoskey is in the process of doing their whole downtown area. Uh, Ham Tramick just reached out to me today. There are a ton of cities that wanna do this and I think it will help bring people downtown into the various areas, south side of Lansing, north side, depending where they're at. Um, I think there's ways to make this happen. Um, but again, 
city council would have control on what's proposed. Um, the city attorney would also put together everything of the plan, the signage, how it would be enforced with the police department, and then liquor control would um, approve from that point. Um, and just also in the resolution I'm considering, it's not in front of you yet, um, we would look at an expiration date of December 31st, 2021, uh, so that we could reevaluate it in 2021, see how it went over that period of time. Um, so, but uh, Council Member Dunbar, you were first and you've been very patient, so we'll let you go on. Cool. Um, I'm fully in support of this. I think we need to help our businesses. Um, <clears throat> it reminds me of what Washington was before it was opened back up to foot traffic, that it could, there could have been a block that was segregated just for street traffic. And I've seen that in a couple of different resort towns so far. My question is, is this, um, is this solely uh, targeted at those establishments where more than 70% of their sales are from liquor because they don't have the food component to it? Or would this benefit the restaurants and the, the liquor establishments? Um, how do you foresee that? Because I, I definitely can think of the spot in Rio Town where we could do that. I can see an old town where you can convert spaces um, and downtown the alley is fantastic. Um, I don't know that there are any locations in South Lansing that are 70% or more of liquor, but if they were to need the spatial, the distancing to be able to put stuff up for their restaurant, would they be qualified for that kind of a thing too? And my final question is, what's the turnaround time at the state once, it's, once we apply for it, how fast would you get it so that we can start relieving these businesses? Council Member Dunbar, let me start real quick. Um, the requirement is not a 70% threshold um, on the liquor sales. It is a licensed, um, a licensee from the Liquor Control Commission. So as long as two or more licensees are in the zone, you can designate it. So you can't set up for a specific place only. You have to have more than one. Uh, that speaks to Mr. Ellis's point about um, venues sharing entertainment and, and that kind of thing. It's, it's, it's to create a, a true social district, not just a backyard patio for another restaurant, which as we've seen in a number of cases, a um, no, number of our restaurants and bars have found ways to do this in um, their, their parking lots and they do not need a special um, dispensation from Liquor Control Commission from this. As far as I know, I'm, you know, correct me if I'm wrong there on that, but this is separate from that. So like how in DL, in the downtown Lansing area, they can apply for a a permit to serve on their sidewalk, but only in a space that's, that's, that's cordoned off. This would be different than that. Still a limited amount of real estate that can be used, but you'd have to have two licensees, which is why Rotary Park area makes some sense because you've got multiple licensees there and an entertainment venue, um, as well as the area I spoke about down by the green door in the uh, first ward, that would be um, multiple venues there when you, when, you, when you factor in green door, the avenue and the um, barbecue place, Acadia. Um, so the old bank. So um, that's that question. And then um, what was your final question, Kathy? Oh, oh you're muted. I'm sorry. The turnaround time. Oh, the and turnaround. It, I'll leave that to Mr. Ellis. Yeah, hmm. my understanding was that there's like any establishment that serves more than 70 can't actually even have anyone inside. They have to do to go um, and that it's been approved for to go to um, for alcohol if there was an establishment, I was just assuming that that would be part of the group that would be served um, by this common congregate area. But the next question definitely is, is what's the turnaround time? How fast can we do this? Two weeks from our perspective, but Scott, you know the, L the Liquor Control Commission better than I do. You're muted, sir. Now you're frozen. There we go. There we go. There we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. So we will be one of the first cities if we get this moving to get it in. And so this is all brand new to liquor control. Uh, they're being very cautious, which is understandable to make sure the city has a good plan put together. Um, the biggest thing is signage to letting the patron know, hey, you can't go past this block with this drink because you're out of the zone. Um, that's the big thing they request. And then of course, police response and that type of thing um, that will be responding to it and that they have a plan. But as far as turnaround, it's up in the air. I think city of Lansing will be one of the first if we can move it. 
and they will work with us to get it through and we'll get a lot of questions answered through that process. And I know Grand Rapids has approved zones already. I'm not sure how far along they are in the process, um, but they're definitely moving forward as well. And one thing to note too, Scott, that I think would, when you mentioned about the zones and the signage, um, because this is a liquor control thing, there are liquor control license violation pr uh, issues and they have to use certain types of cups with their brand on it so that folks can identify that they have purchased it within the zone and can drink within the zone. And if they leave the zone with the cup, there's some, there's potential issues there. Um, so it is, it's, it's designed to be enforced quite easily. Um, but still, you know, people in the city and I don't mean it, the city can enforce and shut it down anytime they want by going to liquor control and saying, Hey, We've had problems. We want them violated, just like any other bar currently. We have to we have to make a nuisance case for them, but it's possible. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Betts. Thank you, President Spadafor. Thank you for being here, Scott. I do have a couple questions. One, I, I do really need. I think that we as council would like a timeline more particular. Are we talking about uh, Peter? Maybe you can answer this. Are we talking about two weeks for a vote on the resolution, and then an additional two weeks for liquor control? I've got businesses over here that are saying they're not going to open until this happens. So I, I need to have some idea of what that looks like. And then my second question is, wow, I forgot it in the midst of my first question. So I guess we'll just answer the first one for now. And if I remember later, I'll raise my hand. Thank you. Well, I can only speak to the council's timeline. Um, it's, it's been a while since I've participated in any M MLCC um, hearings, but the, um, the council, it is my intention to move this in two weeks if possible. Now, if there is not enough votes and you know, too much controversy over it, we, we may not, but um, I've heard from a number of businesses across the city that this would be a wonderful tool in their tool chest to be able to reopen in this, in this strange time as we're looking to um, hey, keep businesses open. I do remember my other question Mr. President, thank you for answering that first one. My, my second question was, it looks like Grand Rapids has not only approved their, um, their social districts, but they've allowed bars to open up in social districts already. We, we, I've seen pictures, people have sent me articles about bars actually opening up these things already. So is there a reason why we need to wait for the Liquor Control Commission? What is Grand Rapids doing that we're not doing that makes us have to wait for the Liquor Control Commission on this. Scott. Um, City Council Member Betts, they are not true zones under this statute. East Lansing did the same thing and they call them social zones and districts. They were not the same thing. They basically roped off an area and said, we're gonna waive the open alcohol ordinance if you're in here and totally different. This would be a legitimate zone that you could walk around kind of like Austin, Texas, and others. So okay. just kind of misleading, unfortunately. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. And to be clear, it's not my intention to lift the open intox ban in the city of Lansing. Um, <laughs> it, you know, you all can try to amend it that way, but this is this is about social districts and social zones. So very specific. So I guess, um, oh, Councilmember Jackson, I'm sorry, I didn't see your hand. Thank you. I just heard uh, something that was a little confused. So is this a response at all to the pandemic and reopening or is this like Mr. Ellis said something that's been working on for two years in Lansing was it I guess what's the it was is there any difference no, uh, Mr. Um, Ellis. Oh, sorry thank you Mr. President council member we had started this on a state level I represent a trade organization plus own a business in the city so we had started on this concept uh, a year and a half to two years ago really got honed in more um, as COVID came along and all these places get shut down and we're seeing that it's better to be outside and trying to encourage people to come back and surveys have shown people want to be outside. So it really just kind of helped speed it up. The governor got behind it, which was very helpful. And we were able to really iron out our differences with liquor control to make sure the city had control. MLCC wanted control and we thought, no, we'd rather leave it on a local level. And we were able to iron all that out with these current rules. So and if I can add to that, Peter, excuse me, um, Councilmember Jackson, from downtown Lansing Inc's perspective, we got involved in the conversation once this was looking like it was gonna be more of a serious conversation at a state level. Uh, and then of course with COVID and 
the need to lift up local businesses as much as we can and support them and allowing them to be open and help on their road to recovery. That's where Scott and I came together and we had a conversation as well with Council President Spadafore. And we're hearing so much more from our businesses on the support that they need. So we thought this was a timely conversation to have. Uh, <clears throat> any questions, are there questions? I, as I said, um, I would like folks to engage in this conversation. We'll be back at the Sakao in two weeks. Um, and if we have a, something that's close to soup, we'll move it through council. If not, we'll keep, we'll keep stirring. But, um, I just wanted to give you all a heads up to start thinking about it. And I didn't, I'm sorry, I didn't have more prepared, but it was get the conversation going, get you thinking, understanding it. Um, Lisa Hagen has been wonderful in the city attorney's office in helping understand the law. Um, and if you guys, if you all need anything from her, um, please reach out. Um, we, I will waive my privilege with her on this topic. So, uh, Scott, Kathleen, thank you for joining us. I'm going to kick you back out. Um, you all have a good one. Um, okay, so the next item is council powers and duties. It is a discussion item with council member Spitzley at the, at the home. So council member Spitzley. Thank you. I almost, my computer almost died. So, you know, as you know, we on council in a number of the common answers that we have received in council. Uh, council member Spitzley, I'm sorry, at least for me, um, you cut out for the beginning of, so if you could start over, that would be ideal. Yeah, because I think my battery's about to die in my pewter, so I had to plug it in. So. Um, how this started was we we are all the council members through email. Can can everybody hear me? Am yes. I, okay. Yes. Through through emails, um, through public comment, through you know trips to Meyer, um, various members of the public are asking us to do certain things, um, asking us, um, you know, why can't we, or asking us to um, investigate certain things and investigate the mayor's office hire um, a private, you know, an outside investigator to, um, to, to do certain things, investigations um, uh, in response to, to some allegations. And, and let's to be blunt, allegations of, of discrimination and improper um, activities. And so for me, it's, it, it, was, it was important for us to have a discussion on what exactly are the powers of council to do that, to hire an outside investigator, to actually use, you know, the language in the charter. I heard that a number of times where we can use the language in the charter to investigate the mayor's office. And so, you know, I, I certainly have a thought that we don't have that authority um, to do that. Um, but it was important to me, and I'm always clear about providing, you know, the legal justification and, and making sure that all my T's are crossed, my I's are dotted through the city attorney's office when I'm providing information back to the public. And so that was, that was the reason I, I reached out to Jim and asked him um, a number of questions. And, and the first question was, does council have the authority to um, conduct an investigation of the mayor's office? Um, does council have the authority to hire an outside investigator to investigate certain allegations, whether they're in the mayor's office or any other city department? And so um, in response to that, um, and, this, and again, this is my fault. I found this, you know, um, city attorney Smirka was very prompt in providing this information back to me. However, I just found it in my inbox this morning. So I apologize that I just sent it out. I meant to send it out before that, but um, the email was to me. And, you know, and then because it's to me, I've, I've shared it with council members. I, you know, have no problem with, I don't know how through FOIA, I guess I can, can it be shared that way as well? I don't know what my, my authority is to share the, member, the memo outside the council umbrella. I won't speak for Jim, but if you're if you're waiving your privilege on it and it's not confidential information, you may share it with whomever you wish. Okay. Well, then I, I am. I don't think it's confidential information, is it, Jim? Go. No, and I just want to clarify. 
Jim, you're gonna have to talk a little louder because I, I can barely hear you. Thank you. Around with my camera, I too was today, and they messed up my microphone. I'll do. I'll fix it before it comes. Okay. If you can hear me, I'm gonna have to yell though, right? Um, yes. Um, it was intended for all the council. Um, yeah. That was okay. the response to that email I got Sunday, whatever Sunday night. That night. Yeah. So it, it's public. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you. And it speaks for itself. So, you know, we'll share the memo to, for, you know, for members of the public that want it. Um, but um, it is, it is basically saying that council doesn't have the authority to investigate the mayor's office, that there's a separation of powers, right? Um, and that, um, you know, Congress does, I mean, Congress, oh my gosh, council does have certain authority, um, but one of them is not um, the authority to, um, uh, investigate the mayor's office. Um, and the other part um, in a nutshell is that the mayor has, because it's a strong mayor system, the mayor has broad um, authority um, because it's a strong mayor form of government um, and that it's really the mayor's responsibility to, um, per the charter, um, you know, um, allegations of discrimination or, or investigate to make sure that they're for reducing unlawful discrimination. Um, so one of the things that, so, so that's kind of in a nutshell that um, what I'm getting out of this memo. Any questions for council member Spitzley? Oh, Mr. Councilmember Jackson, it looks like you got your hand up. Thank you. I was I was looking for the raised hand, but I didn't get there fast enough. Um, so just a few things. I'm I'm sorry I did not read the memo, and that's probably should probably stop talking now. But aren't isn't council allowed to investigate anything that's related to the city of Lansing or the business of Lansing? Did I was that in the charter somewhere? Because it would easily just make the argument that, of course, the mayor's office and what goes on with employees would be the city of Lansing business and matters. And also, and for the city attorney, I don't, it, this is hard for you, I can imagine, just because you're, again, the only position in the charter that has, you know, work for city council, work for the mayor, and now you have to put a memo that, you know, I mean, goes one way or the other, so just want to recognize that not saying there's anything wrong, but you are in a tough spot based on the charter there too. I respond. Yes, Jim. We don't take sides. I mean, we take our responsibility and hopefully for the years that's been here. Jim, I'm sorry, you're gonna have to start over. You're, you're a little bit uh, not, not, not hearable again. Um, this is not mm -hmm. communication, this is- I still can't hear him. This is yeah. a big this was an analysis we did carefully. And it would be different if it were a different form of government. If it were a commission manager form of government or a weak mayor form of government, it might be different. But we look at the charter and the law. We have to look at all sections of the charter. The investigation applies for you developing. You got to, it's all in the memo for policy and law not to investigate, just like the mayor can't investigate council's administrative practices. It works the other way too. We lay all that out in the uh, in the memo. Uh, again, the charter changed in 78 to make it a strong mayor form of government. That's an actual legal term that's used. Uh, the investigation is on, if you look at the memo, it relates to financial records. It doesn't apply financial records. This applies to how the mayor administers the mayor's office. Um, so we've looked at and anticipated that exact question and that's in the memo. Hopefully you heard all that. So I heard from the I heard from you, correct me if I'm wrong, that you've looked at this previously. So this was an analysis you've done carefully, you said it was was your word, and that you are also um, that the analysis that the, that the uh, 1978 change in to strong mayor and then the charter revisions that went along with that stated we can investigate 
for financial issues, but not the operational issues of the, um, of the mayor's office. Yeah. And likewise, he, he's got to stay away from us. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, so in, 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 in finishing this discussion, because I, I, I do think it's an important discussion and I know that people are um, concerned about it. So on page three, the language says harmonizing section 3-2061 with section 4-102.11 means that the council may ask direct questions of the mayor concerning matters relating to the operation or administration of the city. So what, under that umbrella, Jim, what exactly, what are the questions then can we ask the mayor? Matters related to the operation of the city in, in connection with the legislative function okay. is limited to policy and legislation in the charter. There's a specific provision that we reference there. Okay, so for people who are listening, um, <laughs> what, what Mr. Smirk has said, and, and if I if, if I get it wrong, Jim, let me know, is that it's you know that section specifically means again relates to policy or financial um policy and law and financial yes. law yeah policy law and financial and again um it does not relate to according to the city attorney does not relate to matters um in, in uh, investigating the mayor's office for right. any any other perceived wrongdoings now um understand you know my role is i always ask the questions that i think that the public are asking or that the public has asked and, and and these are questions that have been asked and so it is my responsibility to provide that to ask those questions by our city attorney and to get those get those responses back and so that's what we're doing here um so i so i appreciate that anybody else i think you've answered the question for that has been posed to us in a number of ways um thank you very much council much busy for bringing this up Next item on our agenda is other, and I'm surprising you all with an other. Um, I wasn't sure we'd have it ready yet, so I didn't put it on the agenda, but um, August 3rd is a Monday. At 6 p.m., I have reserved the band shell at Adato. Uh, I knew, I lived next door to Adato's. They were related to the Adato's, but I think there was a turf war there and they all, they fought over the, how to pronounce the last name. But anyway, at Adato Riverfront Park. Um, a community conversation with city leaders um, from city council. It is my hope that it will be the president of city council and the chair of our equity, diversity, and inclusion committee. You will all certainly be invited to attend. But this is a listening session, so there's not an active role um, for us to really play. On the call today is uh, Lori Simon, who has agreed to act as our third party facilitator. Um, I recognize that holding the gavel um, presents my, me with a, little, a level of privilege and I really would like to not be in that position. I'd like to be able to listen and hear. Um, so um, I've asked Lori to be on this evening um, and I think we've got her, let me just double check. Oh, Lori, let me make you a presenter here. Hold on, there you are. Uh, Lori, you're able to mute, unmute yourself and show your video if you want to or just unmute yourself if that's what you wish. Um, but Lori's on and she's going to um, tell us a little bit about the, the work that we'll be engaging in. Um, and I also want to remind council in one week from today at five o'clock, we are still going to go forward with our um, implicit bias training. It'll be a little different than was originally envisioned because it will have to be done virtually. But um, the Michigan Department of Civil Rights tells me that the work can be done virtually. It's not as robust. And if we need to do a second round once we can get together again, we will do that, but it was important that we um, that we began this process to me sooner than later because it has been a few weeks since we said we were going to do that. So, Lori, I see you. Welcome. Um, I will be quiet and allow and give, give you the floor. Thank you. Good evening, council members. My name is Lori Simon. I'm senior advisor for diversity and inclusion for Sparrow Health System and the civil rights coordinator. I currently serve as a third ward member for the Board of Ethics. I was the president for two years and I'm currently on the mayor's diversity and inclusion advisory council. Uh, it is an honor to be asked to serve as a moderator for this community conversation with the leaders. I am currently doing the same thing for Sparrow Health System. We are doing our second round uh, tomorrow. And then I've also been asked by 
the mayor's leadership to lead their conversation. So I'm here to um, really assist the council in a way. I love Lansing, the greater Lansing. I believe in the work that you're doing and I wanna assist in any way to make this community better. So I don't know if you have any questions for me, but I, I'm honored to be asked to moderate. Thank you very much, um, Lori. We really appreciate you, you um, helping us on this. Um, it's important to me that we have a robust conversation and I think it will be better with uh, someone who specializes in this type of work. So I really appreciate you, you agreeing to it. And I want to thank Representative Anthony, if you're watching at home for the, for the recommendation. Um, she, she said, I know exactly who to talk to. So, um, and I'm glad you were able to fit it in your schedule. So I appreciate that. Um, there are going to be, it won't be a committee of the whole meeting, um, but it will be uh, like a, an opportunity for folks to, to have a dialogue um, and we will listen. We are um, running into some issues because still the executive order would limit us to 100 attendees outside. So we're going to have to be a little careful there. We're going to have mass requirements, social distancing requirements. Sherry and I are working on the, the cleaning protocol for the microphones um, and those types of things to ensure that the public health is, is, is paramount. Um, we'll probably encourage folks to keep their masks on. Um, because Absolutely. of the proximity that, that we'll be dealing with. Um, and I have also asked um, City TV to see if they're available to record. We can't go live from the park because although there's Wi-Fi there, much to the chagrin of many at this table, um, it's not strong enough to, to broadcast the television um, live. So we're gonna, we'll record for tape and then go from there. But um, this, I don't, I'm not gonna tell you that I have three or four more planned, but I, I don't expect this is the, the, the last step in our work on, um, inclusion um, at all, but it is the first step and we're going to take it on August 3rd. So um, it won't be, you, there will not be attendance taken, but your attendance is strongly encouraged. Um, so, and as I said, it'll be myself and the chair of the diversity, um, the equity, diversity, inclusion committee um, once that person is named in about 15 minutes. So um, thank you, Lori, appreciate your time. You're welcome. And council, if there is no further business before us, we will be adjourned until seven. I'm going, oh, council member Lloyd, right there under the, under the wire. Um, I, I apologize. I thought we were going to look at the uh, chief strategy officer um, and uh, waiving um, the requirements. Yes, um, um, we will do that unless you'd like, if you wanna bring it up now, we certainly can. We were going to do it as a late item on the um, on the council agenda. We can talk about it here if you want. Well, my question would be, how is it getting on the agenda? Is it coming from you, or is it coming from committee of a whole, or what? What was your intent? It's a referral from the mayor's office, and we were going to just move it from the referrals. But if that's not workable, we can take it up here and talk about it. Um, I can present uh, it. Okay. I I think you need a motion to move this forward for action. So that's, that's the only reason I would say that you probably need to do that. All right. Uh, I will, I will remove you. myself from the conversation. Thank you Everyone very much. Lori. Resolution that is being referred this evening would um, allow for the appointment of Ms. Kaler um, waiving the master's degree requirement set out in Lansing Code of Ordinance Chapter 288.98 is one of the requirements for the Chief Strategy Officer position. Um, so that is found in our council packet. I'm happy to um, entertain that resolution this evening as a, if a council member wants to introduce it um, right now. Council Member Wood, is your hand still up? Oh, Council Member Yes, Spencer. that's fine. Oh, council Member Wood. Yes. I, Council I, Member Wood has moved the resolution to uh, waive the master's requirement under Lansing Code of Ordinances, Chapter 288.98. Um, Council Member Spitzley, did you want to address anything? Okay, very good. And I might add that this is not something unusual. There are minimum requirements for all department heads. And if a um, department head is named that doesn't meet those minimum requirements, from time to time, Council has waived those mm -hmm. requirements. Yep. And I think we all know Ms. Kaler from her work in Treasury, um, and I th we will welcome her aboard as the CSO. In fact, the Ways and Means Committee assigned her a project as the CSO last week, so we better waive this requirement. Um, if Ms. No further questions, if Sherry, you could please call the roll on the resolution um, introduced by Council Member Wood to waive the master's requirement in Lansing Code of Ordinances, Chapter 28898. 
Council Member Spitzley. Yes, yes. Council Member Dunbar. Yes. Council Member Jackson. Yes. Council Member Betts. Yes. Council Member Wood. Yes. Council Member Hussein. Yes. Council Member Garza. Yes. Council Member Spadafore. Yes. Motion carries eight zero. Thank you, um, and we will we will take this up as a late item this evening um, at, count, at City Council. So, uh, with no further business for the City Council, we are adjourned at six forty six p.m. Or, I'm sorry, Camille Hall. We are adjourned.